Buonasera signore e signore, benvenuti alla Casa Italiana Zerini Marimò della New York University. My name is Stefano Bertini, I'm the director of the Casa. And it's a great pleasure to welcome you uh, here in this piece of Italy in the village and also to have a chance to share with you some of the uh, experiences that I have the fortune of enjoying when I'm in Florence in the summer uh, with the NYU students. Um, we have the fortune to have here tonight uh, with us Kim Wilkin, uh, who is a landscape architect and had an intense introduction to landscape. He grew up in the Malaysian jungle and Iraqi desert before being sent to school in southern England, having studied history at Oxford and environmental design at the University of California, Berkeley. Kim set up his landscape studio in London in 1989. Since 1994, he has supervised the restoration of NYU's Villa La Pietra Gardens in Florence. And allow me to express my personal thanks for the incredible job that Kim has done on the premises of La Pietra. I was uh, there in 1994, in June, with the first group of NYU students. And while we were walking in the garden, there were actually pieces of concrete and statues literally falling down. And it sort of looked more like a jungle than a garden at that point. And uh, the restoration is, can be considered completed now, and the gardens are absolutely magnificent. And if you have not seen them yet, uh, plan a trip to Florence to go see them because they're worth just a visit. And uh, there are gardens that are very heavily used for a variety of uses. First of all, they are for our students that can uh, relax, enjoy, read, and study uh, in the gardens. Uh, they're also open to the public according to a schedule. And they have a fantastic series of events, normally between May and June, what they call La Stagione. And they have uh, ballet, opera, theater, uh, concerts in the gardens themselves. So they are even more beautiful, even more charming, of course, when, when they're filled of people like when, uh, like in the time of the actors that were, the, as you know, the last owners before NYU. Um, but Kim is not only, we, we love him because of that, and we are grateful to him because of his work at La Pietra, but uh, his work, of course, goes way beyond that. Uh, he's fascinated by the link between land and culture, and between memory and imagination. Uh, Kim Wilkie teaches sporadically at Berkeley <laughs> and writes optimistically about land and place and is involved in various national committees on landscape and environment policy in the UK. He's the author of Led by the Land uh, that has been published this year by Lincoln. And I'm asking you to please welcome Kim Wilkie to come to the Thank you, Stefano, and um, thank you for welcoming me here. Uh, had, have many of you been to La Pietra already? Uh, okay, all right. Well, I'll try. Uh, I'll try to enthuse with you rather than preach at you about it. But um, one of the things that most strikes me um, about La Pietra and that whole Florentine Renaissance is the way that it it captured. Uh, Arcadia, which is a recurring theme. And I've been trying to work out when Arcadia started, with, maybe with Hesiod, um, certainly um, with Theophrastus and, and the Hellenic um, traditions. But it, it really is um, something that has come through the Renaissance and then the Enlightenment and then the Arts and Crafts movement and, and I think even the 1960s was a kind of move back to the pastoral um, understanding of, of nature and that contact with the land. And this, this painting by Poussin um, is, has actually stimulated so much controversy about what it's all about. They are discovering a tomb in Arcadia, and it says on the tomb, et in Arcadia ego, so, and, and I, death, and also in Arcadia. And there's been the, the, the controversy. 
Is it possible to turn this light off? It's kind of, uh, I, 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 I'll move away from it a bit. Thanks, thanks very much. Um, the, um, the, there's been the thought that is that this serpent death um, in the middle of Arcadia, um, and that even in paradise you have um, something going wrong. But, but actually, I, I think that um, it's, it's much more to do with the idea that in that pastoral simplicity in Arcadia, you have the chance to think clearly, to actually have contact with the land and reflect, and that actually you can only contemplate eternity when you think about death. So I think this, rather than being an ominous sign in Arcadia, is actually uh, a sense of, of how when you separate yourself from the frenzy of urban life, you actually can think really, really clearly. <coughs> and, and so we've, we've gone from um, Hesiod right through to the 1960s and flower power with this recurring theme of Arcadia. And now, where does it go? Um, we are at one of the most extraordinary moments, I think, in, in human history, where we have a perfect storm of climate change. That was great just before you turned it back on again. But, yeah, thank you. Perfect, perfect. Thanks very much. Um, of climate change, political change, and financial change, a, a sort of uncertainty as to where we go next. And I have a feeling that that Arcadian simplicity, that relationship with the land, is something that's going to lead us through um, and has become particularly relevant. But to return to La Pietra, this is a mural um, on the wall in the kitchen. And, and you can see um, that it has all of the classic themes of Arcadia, the flowing water, the shepherdesses, people having a good time, um, uh, fruit trees, olive trees, and then in here, the pomario. Um, and, and on the other side, there, there was another walled garden of, of the villa. And that element of good food, contact with land, um, and, and what's called um, otio, um, that it's a word that I don't think has ever been properly translated into English, but it is to do with that sense of relaxation and connection with nature that allows the poetry and the philosophy to flow um, and, and is still very present there. And what's interesting is that negotio is business and the whole reason for the whole, uh, coming out to these villas and these gardens was to be away from the city. So here's La Pietra, there's Florence. It's not very far away, but it's just far enough away to be separate from that urban life. And there's a, a lovely piece by Jonathan Bate um, where he says, uh, I get it absolutely right if I can, um, in Song of the Earth, he says, you only need Arcadia when your reality is Rome. <laughs> and, and, uh, and it is that, that contrast with urban life. We need urban life, we need to relate to one another, but we also need to separate ourselves from it to contemplate eternity and our relationship with the divine. So La Pietra has managed to capture that um, and retain it. And what I'd like to do to start with is just look at how some of that works and how the restoration has, uh, has gone forward over the last 18 years or so. But just, um, so there, there is the the area, the entrance into La Pietra across this valley which comes down, flows down towards Florence. And there's the Montugi Ridge where it sits with the, um, the, the villa there with the walled gardens that we just looked at in the um, mural to either side of it. And then dipping down again um, uh, across to the Villa Falli across the, the other side of that valley. And it's that position I'm perfect in terms of air drainage, but also um, for, for growing the food um, and for having the views back to the Duomo. And that uh, was first built by a good banking family, Medici bank bankers, the Sassetti family, and then the Caponi family. 
Um, and, and then in 1904, the Actons came. And um, so it's Arthur, Hortense, uh, Harold, and, and William. And, and brought it back um, to life, but brought it back very, very clearly to the vision that uh, Scipione Caponi um, had had before, which was this, this place of repose, reflection, and particularly good food. Um, this was the garden when they found it at the beginning of the 20th century, um, a, a giardino al inglese, which actually was a kind of a complete disaster. They had swept away the Renaissance garden. It was all these um, conifers and flowing paths and missed the whole point of what the villa was meant to be. And so, fascinatingly, the archives <coughs> show um, this survey. So there, there's the villa. These were the flowing paths around and about. And you can see in Arthur's hand him starting to sketch where the, the prima vasca at the top would be, the seconda vasca, taking in the steps there. But very interestingly, these cross vistas across like that and through like that, that's where the Colosso is there, all the way down to a view out to the Villa Faldi there. And then you can see, should it be a circle, <coughs> should it be an oval? An absolutely fascinating document of, of how they were working with the ideas of a Renaissance <coughs> garden, but not doing it as an archaeological exercise, doing it as a, a philosophical and a design exercise. And it, it was, as I was looking at this um, on the plane over this afternoon, I, I was thinking, it's fascinating that Arcadian and pastoral elements of design are actually quite scientific and strict. It is the, the loosening of um, the romantic English garden that misses the point. But actually the Renaissance garden uh, was, was very um, architectural and very um, well-ordered and balanced. And that was what the Actons were bringing back to La Pietra, not as an accurate um, archaeological exercise, but as a, as a, a way of un encapsulating the spirit of it. And so it is arranged on these, um, so that, there's the Prato Valley that I was showing you, and these, the circles, the ovals, the cross vistas that go all the way up and down and across this ridge, based um, on first the, the causeway that comes in. That's what it looked like when they arrived, and that's what they did to it. And then a fantastic view down to the Duomo. And all of the villas around Florence have that key view down to the, the Duomo. Um, and one of the excellent things about the Duomo is that it's, it's completely um, democratically sided. There isn't a front or a back. You, know, you can place your villa anywhere you like and still get a prime view. And then that's the view out to the Villa Falli. Um, and then at the same time, as well as uh, creating this Renaissance vision of, of how the garden would have been, um, the Arthur and Hortense were collecting statuary at a phenomenal rate, and, and there is a really brilliant collection of statuary there. And using these architectural rooms to display the statues to the greatest effect. I mean, if, you, if you have absolutely too many in there, it looks like a jungle sale. But if you manage to divide them up into, into these rooms, it works uh, really well. And then with the, the, uh, the beautiful lime wash behind them in places, um, and, and Things like this statue of Eridano only gets the sun in the early morning. So each time you walk around the garden, you see <coughs> something completely different, and the sun will just spotlight one, um, one sculpture that you won't notice for the rest of the day. So uh, that, that perambulation around the, the space um, with the control of light and the control of texture is, is very, very clever. But, the real heart of the garden is still left over from the Baroque um, walled garden of Scipione Caponi. And that's what it looked like in the 19, I think this is the 1930s, it could be just after the war, but I think it was the 1930s, at its height. 
with um, the, the, the wonderful Limonaya destroying the lemon trees at the end, the, um, the pool in the middle, and very, very productive gardens and pear trees all the way around. As Stefano said, um, by the time um, Sir Harold had died, it, it was not looking at its best. Absolutely, um, yes. <laughs> it had really <laughs> fallen apart. And, and gradually, gradually, it's, um, it's, it's coming back into its own there. And one of the best things is at night, with all of the scents and the vegetables there, and all the candles lighting it up, it is a, a, a really wonderful place. And um, the, the maize variety that's there, we managed to trace back to the seeds that Hortense brought over. So, and the zinnias and, and a lot of the plants there are now um, traced back to what um, Hortense um, brought from Chicago. And, and that is the Limonara, which I think is my favorite bit of the entire um, villa complex. And these, these lemon trees go out through the summer, but um, then in, in, in the winter, actually still the scent that's in there is, is extraordinary. But it wasn't just a question of replanting. This was the Viale, the causeway, um, that connects from the Via Bolognese to the villa, which was, you can see, um, about to fall down, a combination of um, age, frost, and blocked drains um, meant that the whole lot was um, in real danger of collapsing. Glad to say that has finally been completely finished now, and that's the Viale, with all of the olive trees being replanted in the, in the valley around it. And the other really very close miss was the little temple, the Tempietto, um, just to the side of the villa, where the vegetation had been stripped out, so in those heavy Florentine downpours, all of the soil was washing away, and there was a great crack through the dome. It was about just a bit of giraffe split of its legs, and the whole lot was going to go down. So uh, with uh, micro piles underneath there to support it, and then crucially getting all of the drainage and the water flow right, and putting, most importantly, putting vegetation back around it so that it looks like something out of an Arcadian landscape, but also that the, the roots are saving the um, soil and, and saving the buildings. But the, apart from those really urgent structural um, repairs, our first thought uh, when we um, went there, and and Bob was very brave with this, was actually we had to tackle the green architecture before we tackled the stone architecture, because the whole structure of the place is based on those finely clipped plants. And you can see that that range of textures, of, um, of cypresses, of um, box, of um, bay, of pines, that, that critical shades of different greens and textures is, is what it was all about. So, we, we went in, it looked quite bad when you saw it in 1994. It looked an awful lot worse by 1996 after we <laughs> chopped most of it down. Um, and I'll take you through some of those examples. But gradually, those wonderful topiary shapes uh, are being brought back in, in the U. Those will turn into great goblets. I'll show you those again a bit later. But that's um, what it quickly looked like and trying to work out from the photographs, from the land, from the sense of the design, um, how it would look like, it took, took a long time, but that went to that. And then the long vista del arco went from that to that. And, and then this is the view from the, um, from the circular, um, you saw he had sketched a circle around here, going down to the oval lawn. That's what it looked like, all, all ripped out. And that's um, uh, what it's come back to now. And those, um, those cypresses would all join up into, into a, a complete smooth hedge again, um, very shortly. But down below, I think one of the best 
and most original spaces, the um, Prato Ovale, um, where they, they did play tennis, but it, it, it is right on the edge of the, um, of the property and does look down towards the Duomo. And it is this extraordinarily beautifully proportioned space. But growing in there are <coughs> some wonderful orchids and wildflowers. And, and as you walk across it, this scent of, of mint and um, uh, oregano and, um, and so on comes up. It is lavender. And lavender's there too, yes, yeah. Um, and it is that combination of structure, of um, antique history, and then wild um, nature as well, which I think encapsulates the Arcadia of, of La Pietra. Um, but now we're able to return to an awful lot of the stonework, and it is painstaking repairing things like these very delicate mosaics. And when I talk about painstaking, you should see the pain that the statues go through. Really is <laughs> brutal, but bit by bit um, they are all coming back and, and being restored, and um, uh, and we can take on about six statues a year, and and eventually the whole collection will be saved. But I've I have uh, left out the key character in all of this, um, who's Nick Dakin Elliot, the who's taken on the role of head gardener and entire energy sort of um, combustion behind the restoration. He, he came two years after we'd done the, um, the analysis and assessment of the place and has been working tirelessly with a great team there. And um, uh, without him, none of this would have been possible. But saving up um, probably the one of the most famous spaces till the last. Um, this is the Teatrino. And you know I showed you those little bits of you being trained into goblets. Um, these, those are the goblets there that they will grow back into, um, complete urns and, um, and vases. And almost all of that had gone. Um, but the theatre was, and has always been, a crucial part of gardens. And this particular theatre, um, uh, had, uh, has had some fantastic um, people involved in it. Um, I'll come on to that in a second. But that's, that's what it looked like probably in the 1950s. That's what we were faced with. Um, and, and a slightly hunched and despairing Nick at that point um, uh, with his dog. Um, but it now has come back to that. And then when you look down from there, um, out towards Florence. That's the lower area that you see from there. And from up above, um, uh, you can see how all of the wings and, um, and how the actors can come on uh, and work with all of this. <coughs> but one of the best photos, this is a photograph by Cecil Beaton of um, Harold and Margot Fontaine oh. um, dancing um, in, in the theatre there. Uh, and, and Bridget Bardot has danced there, and most recently, um, Dame Judi Dench came wow. with the Royal Shakespeare Company oh, wow. and uh, did an absolutely wonderful performance there. And it is, um, actually, there you can see Bob. <laughs> um, uh, 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 and it is so good that a place that has had a theatre in it and, and has been so theatrical is as alive with theatre um, now. <coughs> But it's also a place where the whole country house um, generation of, um, of not only poetry and philosophy, but also politics, the number of cocktail parties that have happened on the terrace at La Pietra that have really decided some fairly fundamental things. Just to give you a flavor of it, um, uh, Vita Sackville West, um, down here with, uh, with her husband, she came quite regularly and um, was inspired to um, design Sissinghurst, which is possibly one of the best gardens, um, or best known gardens in England, very much influenced by what she saw here at Villa La Pietra. 
but in terms of politics, um, a very young Winston Churchill having lunch with Arthur at um, um, quite a young Diana uh, having lunch with Sir Harold, and then um, more recently um, a, a heads of state conference, um, and uh, and so. Yeah, I haven't been able to pick out absolutely everyone here. But, um, this one I definitely know. Who's this? No, Schmidt. The German child. Oh, is it? Yes. Um, so, but it, there is that sense of um, Ethan Arcadia is politics and, and the ability to, to take people out of the city to a place like this, really to think clearly and to, to discuss, is something that NYU is carrying on in a very strong tradition. But also that the place is now full of students, and I think that's one thing that Sir Harold was particularly keen on that the place should remain alive with um, students eager to absorb the place and the culture and, and Florence. And so, as, as one of the first villas to embody uh, the Florentine Renaissance and return to the Augustan poets and the <coughs> ethics of Arcadia, um, La Pietra has managed to keep that going with a consistency um, which is more alive now than it ever has been. And it is a, a place where poetry, philosophy, and reflection are still an integral part of the whole ethos of, of the place. And it has been a real privilege um, to, to work on the restoration, and, and particularly things like getting the valley back planted with olive trees, working out the water, how it sits together as a sustainable um, venture for, for the coming centuries. But it's, it's also helped me to think in other projects exactly what that contact um, between man and nature could and should be. And that removal from um, the frenzy of urban life to think clearly is something that uh, I came across uh, in a monastery in the Arctic Circle of, of Russia. Um, and, and so living on the land in a way that can be sustained and that really is related to the land is, is a theme I think that's affected all of my work ever since. This monastery is extraordinary. Um, you see it there, uh, it, it's a 24-hour it's a train ride from St. Petersburg up to the port on the White Sea, and then you set off in this boat out over the sea, looking as though you're going straight to the North Pole, <coughs> and then very, very slowly, you just see one um, dome coming out of the water and then they all gradually emerge, and this, this white monastery appears, and you don't see any land to start with, so you just see this, this monastery floating um, on the edge of what feels like the edge of the world. And it is a place where the Rus Russian Orthodox priests went to get as far away from the center of power to be as spiritual and sacred and, and removed from humanity to be, uh, have contact with the divine. But it's also a place which has been, uh, yes, uh, which was then taken over by Lenin as the first in the Gulag Archipelago, and there's been as much that has been vicious and evil there as there has sacred. So it remains one of the most important places in the whole of Russia, and has been for 5,000 years. Um, out in, in the archipelago, there are these um, fantastic um, labyrinths and um, uh, little stone megaliths that have been uh, acknowledged by people for, um, for 5,000 years of the very special nature of the place. And living on that edge of, uh, of survival really made people 
understand the sensitivity of the land. And what they did, extraordinarily, was to connect up all of the lakes in the, um, in the main island with these channels, these stone channels, which then drained um, meadows beside them, which enabled them with just enough grass to support just enough cattle to produce just enough dung to fertilize just enough vegetables <laughs> to get them through the winter. Uh, and they harvested just amount, the right amount of seaweed to supplement that. They would never fell a tree, they would only pick up broken wood, broken branches. And they knew the fragility, just how much they could push that environment. And it, it was always technologically incredibly advanced. It was one of the first places where they used hydroelectricity in, um, in Russia. But it was at the same time as being technically very sophisticated and, um, uh, and scientifically very advanced. It was extraordinarily sensitive to what the Earth could support. And there is a point where three little hills cluster together um, facing south, where the Earth's crust is also very thin, that there's enough heat in summer that they can grow melons and support um, uh, enough bees, not just for honey, but to create the wax that they needed for the light to get them through six months of darkness. And, and it's sort of lovely, that, that finesse of understanding how you cope with life on the edge of the Arctic Circle um, and really make the most of what um, nature can offer. And then things like, this is uh, aerodynamically or, or um, in terms of um, wave dynamics, this causeway between two islands um, is shaped just to resist the waves without being destroyed by them and also to create little pockets where they could um, farm fish. And I talked about the hydroelectricity. There is, there is um, the, the main monastery, and there's, I think, a nine meter difference between the sea and the lake that they created above it. And in that nine meters, they um, managed to get uh, a water wheel to create hydroelectricity. So um, it's, it's an extraordinary place. It's a World Heritage Site, um, and I'm doing a kind of restoration there which is trying to balance the evil history, the sacred history, the um, extraordinary natural history, um, and, and make it work um, as a viable place um, for the future. And the politics are remain quite tense in that area. But water, I think, in our next few decades is going to be one of the most crucial issues, not just too much of it, but actually um, having enough to drink and enough to grow food with. And I'm working um, just um, across in at Longwood Gardens um, on a project for a new entry plaza there. Uh, and this is Pierre Dupont's um, um, holiday cottage. Uh, and he, he built these um, extraordinary glass houses. His, his actual house was there and the, the fountain garden. But right at this point, um, at the end of the conservatories, there was a need for a new plaza um, for bringing people in from the uh, entrance there. And one of the most crucial things that, um, that they needed was, uh, as well as an entry point, was lots and lots of restrooms. Um, and they were about to design Kind of in the theme of the glass house, kind of Versailles-like um, uh, orangery um, to put restrooms in. And I said quite quietly, you know, the one thing you don't need an awful lot of glass for is, right. is a restroom. And, um, mm -hmm. and so came up with a design where we would do a big earth form with the whole of the building tucked underneath the earth form and these curving terraces facing south down into the garden. And that was the model. So that's, that's the main entrance into the conservatories there. That's the spine of the building underneath the earth form. And that's the view down into the gardens. 
and that's it as it, as it was um, constructed. Um, and within that glass spine, um, there is this concept that you have um, little individual domed restrooms underneath the ground. Um, the dome is a fantastic structure for, um, for supporting um, soil, but then with a little a light funnel that brings light down into it. So you don't have the building intruding in there, but you have these, these restrooms off this curving spine. And on the outside, they look, they look like that, <laughs> um, which is modeled on the top Kapi Palace in Istanbul. <laughs> but, but inside you get this lovely filtered light. And then down through the core of it, um, is this green wall. So these are the entrances into e each of the restrooms and then these are all the, the ferns growing in there. Um, and green walls are, if you're growing ferns, they like to be in damp, um, fairly shady, dark places. They do not like to be on a big, exposed, um, uh, southern face wall. Um, and here they are really, really happy, but the message of it is this is a place that uses a great deal of water, but you can recycle it through plants, um, and what better place to show that example than in, um, in a whole restroom complex. <laughs> and uh, at, bizarrely now, I think the restrooms are one of the main visitor attractions in the <laughs> gardens. But it is, it is wonderful what you can do with earth, uh, buildings and plants and the conservation of water as a way of moving forward with our thinking of, of um, how we build into the future. So, good food. Um, essentially, um, Italian concept and, and one that I have become more and more preoccupied with. But I don't know if you have Tesco's here yet, but this is our sort of main supermarket. Um, and this, in a way, sums up everything that's been convenient about the 20th century. Huge area of asphalt, lots of cars, and a big, big um, food store. Um, which, all of which aren't particularly good um, for the environment. Uh, and um, there's a lot of um, discussion at the moment as to how the supermarkets are um, strangling the, the farmers. And, and the scale of how things are bought, how things are grown, how the whole question of food getting to our plates is, is going to be viable into the future. One of the things I'm most preoccupied about is just calling food food rather than making a distinction between storable foods such as grains and rice and perishable food um, with high water content. And salads, perishable foods, fruits, need to be grown. They don't need very much soil, and they need to be grown as close to where people are going to be um, eating them and population centers as possible. That way they can be really, really fresh, and they can be grown on roofs, on, in window boxes, in the center of cities, and not filled with preservatives and, and deep frozen from um, way out uh, outside of the city. So that's one of the things that I'm becoming quite passionate and involved in, and also the relationship between children and food. Too many playgrounds in England look like this, when Alice Waters has shown that they can look like this. Um, and another influence, I studied at Berkeley, and I paid my way by being a busboy in Alice Waters' restaurant, so uh, I'm a complete and uh, utter fan of hers. But that introducing children to growing things and then cooking them as part of the curriculum, I think is a, um, <coughs> an important way forward. Um, not only <laughs> for their mental health, but for um, the health of our planet and our cities. And so one of the big projects I'm working on at the moment in London is in Chelsea. This was an old um, military bar barracks. It's a 13 acre site right beside the Royal Hospital, which is where the Chelsea Flower Show happens. But um, it's, uh, it, it's expensive real estate, and the development there has been based further completely around the, um, 
the public spaces and the, um, the, uh, the gardens and the open spaces, the buildings come later. And I think for the first time, um, a British local authority has given consent for the, the landscape before they will consider the buildings. The buildings have to fit within the landscape. And so working on the way that this used to be the market garden for London was full of lots and lots of um, vegetable gardens, fruit gardens, nurseries, because um, until the railways came, you had to have that food very close to the center of population. You, and it's deep alluvial soils beside the river with good flow of air. And so now I've designed this with the main um, 100 yard square going up to um, the, the little central plaza being entirely vegetables. So that's a vegetable plot um, uh, run by professional gardeners with a farmer's market and restaurant at the top here. And that's an apple orchard, that's a walnut um, orchard, a pear orchard, uh, and then hazelnuts down here. And then for the affordable housing, this is unaffordable, that's, that's affordable. Every, every project has to have 20% um, affordable housing um, they then have um, their own gardens where they can grow vegetables. And this, this was not an easy concept to get past um, the um, realtors. Uh, this is, as I said, some of the most expensive real estate in the world. The houses there go for $60 million. Um, and, and they say you can't have people paying that kind of money looking out over vegetable plots. So actually, probably that's the one thing that really will help to sell the place, that you, if you have beautifully grown food as, right. as, yes. as, as your main focus, and you show that a city can be really sustainable, then that's the way forward. Mm -hmm. And uh, so restaurant vegetables mm -hmm. make it all beautiful. But finally, I've talked about Arcadia as being to do with politics, philosophy, food, but also poetry. And um, in the last couple of projects, I'm going to show you how I've been inspired in England by the particular, particular poetry of the land there. And it is, it is a place where it rains, where it grows grass, um, and, uh, and where it's actually got a very, very long tradition of, of earthworks. This is Avebury Ring um, in um, Gloucestershire, a bit further down from Stonehenge. And in a way, even more powerful, you get these wonderful megaliths there. And there is this very long sense of human settlement on the land and, and a real relationship with the land and the stars, um, which is still fantastically evident in these earthworks. And then more humbly, um, something called Ridge and Furrow, which is, has survived in a lot of pastures. And in the Middle Ages, um, the, the plough could, could only plough in one direction, so it would go up and tip the land in one direction, and then they'd turn around and it would tip it back. So you get these, um, these ridges, which in a flat light at midday, you don't really see, but um, one thing we get is very long twilight, and then these long, long shadows um, show up this wonderful kind of corduroy form on the land, which has just come from the practicality of, of farming it. And the final inspiration has been um, Andy Goldsworthy, um, who uh, takes these ideas, these very simple ideas, and expresses them with such wit this is called taking a wall for a walk. Um, and, and it's in the Grisdale um, sculpture park. These walls were, have been there um, for a very long time. They cleared the fields um, and, and then penned in the sheep with, with walls by, by, by taking the rocks off the fields so the sheep could graze them. Then that fell apart. They planted larch trees to, um, for timber. And then it, became, um, then it became a sculpture park. So Andy Goldsworthy, just looking back into that history, saw the remnants of the wall, saw the trees, and then just wove 
a beautiful wall through that with humour, but with response to what's been there. So it's that kind of poetry that's responding to the land that isn't pretentious, is witty, but is, is very sensitive. And I think that's, those are the three big influences. So I'll show you the two projects. The one is um, Byton in Northamptonshire. And um, um, this, this is the house, which again has sort of grown and grown. It belongs to the Duke of Buccleuch. And it's a family that managed to marry incredibly well um, for so many generations <laughs> that he's now the largest landowner in Europe. Uh, and, uh, um, and this landscape is um, based, you can see there's the house, it's based on extraordinary geometry. It was um, set out at the, at the end of the 17th century, beginning of the 18th century, by the first Duke of Montague, who had been ambassador at um, Louis XIV's court. And he brought back really sophisticated ideas of, of the mathematics of geometry of laying out Baroque gardens. But then his son took away the French influence, stripped out any flowers um, and decoration, and kept it strictly as gardens of grass, water, and trees. And this, um, you, I, I don't know if you can see the, the, the slight lines that are through here, but all the way through here, there are um, incredible <coughs> Masonic symbols, and he also introduced Freemasonry in. This I don't understand at all, but I have been able to unravel quite a lot of this, which is to do with the golden section and the classical proportions. And this, this mount here um, is set within a golden section. Opposite it is another golden section. And then there's a pattern of squares that goes up to another one here and another one here, and that's half a mile. Now, after this, um, after 1720, the family gained so much land in Scotland that they moved away and left it alone. And there was a, on a map, there's the hurried over that was left there. And my brief was partly to restore this, but then to bring in something of our own time um, in, to inspire, um, inspired by that. So that's what that man looked like when I arrived. And stripped off underneath those trees, that's, that's what was there. Um, when, when we restored it. And then this was the bit that we had to find something to do with. I think he was imagining that we would do a rival mount here, something, a kind of Scylla and Charybdis uh, across the water. But actually, it's such an important landscape that I suggested rather than going um, up with another mount, why don't we just invert it and go down um, uh, right down um, with an inverted pyramid and then take a path that goes down there as well and then acknowledge the golden section just very quickly the golden section is based on the principle of a rectangle that can be divided into a square and leave a rectangle of the same proportions so that rectangle that rectangle is divided the square another rectangle and on and on and on and if you join up all of the corners you get the golden section spiral, and and that is related to the Fibonacci series and, and, and other things too. But it is it is the basis of um, classical design, and it was lovely to be able to express that in um, in one of the few um, Baroque um, Bridgeman landscapes that survive. So that's what it looks like um, uh, now that it's there. And I was also inspired by James Terrell, this idea of looking up at the sky and seeing the clouds in an abstracted frame. And what you do by looking down um, uh, 20 feet into the earth is you see the, the clouds reflected um, and, and the sky reflected in the water. It's also based on the, um, uh, the idea that you have Olympus on the mount and then Hades down below, and then classical um, Hadrian architecture in, in, in between. 
and that it is a great place for music. Um, so I called it the Orpheus. But as part of all of that, I also became fascinated by Vitruvian Man and thought, so there's the mound, and it used to have a circle on the top. This is the new design here with the rill of water going down into the earth. And I thought, what would happen if I um, put Vitruvian Man on top? It actually works rather well. I was also working on Kensington Palace at the time and tried the same thing there. And it, it, that was really eerie because um, that really did, the circle works right the way around the palace with the triangle going to the front door. And then his arms work down each of the avenues. And uh, it is, I don't quite understand how it all fits together, but there is a sense that once you start working with classical proportions, you get something very unique. Um, so that's what it looked like. That's what it looked like um, uh, a couple of weeks later. And, uh, and that's what it's like now. One of the technical difficulties is you've got a river flowing through here. And this is um, six meters beneath that river. Um, seven meters, actually, so it's 21 feet. Um, and the, the clay lining is crucial in keeping the water pressure out. Um, and, uh, but it is now a place, oh, everyone asks how it's known. Um, that's how it's known, in the rain. And we even now have um, a, a um, remote control mower that, that does it as well. But um, it's a place now very much um, for, for music, for theater. Um, this um, is springing the, the perfect cube out of the classical proportions. And this um, can be covered with um, materials so you can have dancing figures inside or um, sculptures hung from it. Um, you can get 2,000 people um, down in there. To get, that's me to show you the size of it. Um, well, it, is, it is huge, the scale of it. Um, and, uh, and then, but the crucial thing was that to insert something that modern into <coughs> the classical landscape of, of this importance, I was very anxious that it shouldn't intrude. So when you're actually on the ground, that's all you see. It, that, that is 1720, um, but the whole um, inverted pyramid, it doesn't intrude into your vision until you get to the edge there. And I think that ability to respect what's gone before um, and be inspired by it, but yet, yet to do something completely fresh that sits alongside comfortably is, I hope, um, a way of being led by the land in very many ways, but, but led by our presence on the land. Um, and, uh, and that idea of the clarity of thought and inspiration that can come from stepping out of the city for a while. And as a final thing, if you want to read any more about it, oh no, goodness, <laughs> oh, one more. Uh, yeah, we, we, one. Yes. we have, okay. Um, uh, one more very quick project, which is just um, beside where, where I live, friends of ours, um, who uh, had a house um, that where the land um, came right up, um, obscuring some of the windows. So I came up with a project to cut it back and open it out um, like that. So these actually rise up to either side. So it's the idea of how a bird turning would be with that being the spine of the bird. And, um, and so the great thing of that's then looking back um, where the, the soil used to come, I mean, it, was, it was up at this level before, and um, pulled it back. And, and the great thing about frost is it shows these, these shapes in, in a whole other way too. But better than that, you can leave the banks to grow um, with long wild flowers. And, and then for children's theatre, it's, it's, uh, this was the Twits um, Royal Dahl that, that was playing that. So, so that, that, that was just to show you another more playful element of how you can use land form and shadow and frost. And, um, and finally to say, if you want to read more about it, just brought this book out. But thank you very much for... Um, <laughs>
picture. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Would you take it? Absolutely. Yes. Yes. Any questions? Do you have any question for Mr. Wilkie? Yes. Um, can you say anything about the architects who first worked with uh, Arthur Acton to build the gardens and to create the Arcadian look? Well, I mean, there's, there's, um, Nick and I don't completely agree about this. Um, Pinsent um, was um, starting in Florence around that time and did do a design for a, um, for a small building, but, but did not do the designs for Villa La Pietra. Um, Suarez um, was involved for, for a short while there, but, but wrote that he learnt, he was studying under Arthur and learnt everything he knew from Arthur. So I actually think it was an extraordinary and not unusual for that period combination of very inventive clients who, who experimented and continue to experiment on the garden. And that, um, those pencil marks that I showed you on that plan were not the pencil marks of a professional. They were very much Arthur's hand and, and Hortense's um, support uh, making that garden. So I actually think a lot of the charm of it is that it isn't professionally designed. It is a very, very personal garden and a personal view of what the Renaissance meant at the beginning of the 20th century. Right, right at the Yes, yes. Yeah. Having done any work at High Grove and have you met with Prince Charles on any projects? Funny enough, um, Prince Charles was the one who asked me to go to the Russian Arctic Circle. Um, <laughs> possibly so that I wouldn't get involved in High Grove. <laughs> but I mean, that, I mean, I wonder if that's stimulated by my saying um, an amateur. Um, uh, with a love for a garden. Because I think that if Highgrove has a charm, it is that it is very much his garden. He has brought in people to help him, but it is a very personal garden um, and, uh, and, and has, has some clumsiness because of that, but it has a real charm because it is very much his garden. <coughs> yes? What does uh, Robert Smith fit into your... Uh well, I do some body of work. Uh, I mean, but, but I worship him, yes. Uh, <laughs> Spiral Jetty is just fantastic. Um, no, that, that, uh, one of the things that I am particularly interested in is how not only land art has diverged between um, North America and, uh, and actually Northern Europe, um, but but also how the whole Enlightenment um, changed between Northern Europe and, and America. And I think the French influence, strangely enough, has been much stronger, so that um, the Arcadian notion of man being in the countryside and being productive is something that's come through quite strongly in English traditions. But here, the idea of wilderness and the noble savage um, and, um, and an untouched nature um, it has been a stronger tradition. And, and I suspect that as we demand more of the land uh, and get to 9 billion population, we're going to have to shift more towards the idea of man in the land rather than a, an untouched wilderness. Um, I fear what happens in that process, but I think there needs to be a real sensitivity that, that comes with that. But to go back to your original question, the, the earth forms and the, the land art that's happened here, and, and I actually put the Vietnam Memorial in that um, category as well, is, is fantastic and is, is on a different trajectory because it's different land and, and different scale. What about Cadillac Ranch? Tell me about Cadillac Ranch. Oh, Cadillac Ranch by Antoine. Again, a, one of the contemporaries of Walter Villarreal and Smithson. They were they're the ones who buried the Cadillacs. Oh um, yes, yes, of course, yes, yeah. Well, that's. Um, 
that has the same playfulness that um, Andy Goldsworthy um, has as well. Yes, yes. No, I like that very much. Yeah. Uh, what about storage space? Uh, are you familiar with Storm King? You know, I desperately want to well, go to see Storm King. Maya, Maya I know, I, yes, I've only yeah. seen that in photographs. Yes. I love it. Um, yes, it's beautiful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. no, I, if I had more time. But, uh, and you know, there is a Storm King in Italy near Florence, Fattoria Celle by Giuliano Gori near Pistoia. It's, I've heard about yes, that. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. It's a beautiful sculpture garden with a lot of landscape art. Next time you are in Tuscany with Stefano, you should go and visit. <laughs> I'd like to, yes. Yeah, no, it's, um, but Storm King is one that, um, that I've, I've wanted to see for a very long time. What's what's become of the swimming pool at La Pietra? <laughs> <laughs> we are not using it. That's pretty ah. <laughs> there, there are some fantastic photographs which I'm not allowed to show of Princess Margaret enjoying the swimming pool. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I, 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 it would be so wonderful to restore it, but with 400 students, um, <laughs> it, it's, um, the, there are health and safety issues. Uh, um, but one day, is that the right answer? Well, exactly. <laughs> we're, all, we're all looking at Bach. <laughs> yes. I was intrigued by the uh, beautiful work you did with the wall, the growing wall. And I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about, um, first of all, the kind of cost of, of that. Uh, and then uh, there's a lot of interest here in New York in green roofs. Yeah. And I wonder if uh, that inspires any of your, your other projects, uh, maybe on a smaller scale than some of the beautiful ones you showed us today. Um, and one, one of the, th I find myself um, in, in two minds about those green walls. I, I, um, I was hinting that some of the ones that are done on the outside of buildings, mm -hmm. um, where the plants are constantly failing and are done in quite elaborate patterns, um, I mean, they, they are, for a while, they're, they're very beautiful, but they are extremely expensive to maintain, and they're sometimes presented as sustainable solutions rather than art. Um, at, at Longwood, because it's inside, and the plants are growing where they want to grow, and they are um, very carefully drip um, irrigated, um, and they have all the expertise to, to grow them there. It isn't, I mean, that they are thriving. Mm -hmm. and, and it is, um, there are systems now, which you probably know about, which are, are, are quite light and quite um, robust. So, so there it seems to work extremely well. And as a way of filtering water, it's, it's very good. Green roofs are, um, are extraordinary, but Again, that often the solution is just to put sedum on the top or, uh, or, or go for a, a fairly minimal intervention. And it's good at reducing peaks in stormwater. It's, it's good at creating <coughs> some habitats. But what I would like to see much more is areas where it's used for positive growth of vegetables and, and, and productive um, use of roof space and all sorts of space um, uh, with the unemployment levels in cities and, uh, and the low requirements just to grow things, it seems an obvious fit of, of labour, space and where you need to eat food um, to use roofs, um, wasted uh, areas um, and, uh, and really to make the city is productive as possible. Yes. Yeah. I just personally wanted, wanted to thank you and all those involved in restoring La Pietra. Um, not only did I have the honor and the privilege to live there in 1998, but I was married there in 2005. So I have the most memorable, uh, original, one of a kind wedding photos that people compliment me all the time. <laughs> thank you. And, and in the garden? In the garden, yes. Perfect. Yeah, I'm that's more cheerful than I've, I've, <laughs> but, but I've, um, I've done a project in the center of the Victoria and Albert Museum in London, and a number of people come to me and say that they've had their um, 
relatives' ashes scattered there. So we're ready to go. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yes. I just the massive scale of your uh, architecture is intriguing. Uh, I just wanted to what extent the principles that you espouse and, and you've adopted in, in doing these things, the geometrical proportions of the gardens, will can translate into relatively small spaces. Absolutely, they can. Um, and um, uh, in fact, I, I had a tiny, tiny little garden in um, in London um, where. The great thing about low light is you only have to do something about nine inches um, high, and it can cast a fantastic shadow. So I did, I, I not nearly as elegant as uh, as my Lynn's, but I did a kind of wave garden um, in my in my tiny back garden in, in London. And yeah, it, it's I mean just soil and mud are great to play with, uh, and, and it doesn't matter the scale that you do it. Thank you very much. And uh, I think Kim just gave us a proof that the landscape architect also has to be a philosopher. And as we know, most of the uh, great um, Renaissance humanist philosophers conceived their ideas in beautiful Renaissance gardens. And the idea was that the two things, the thinking, the production of ideas, of, of culture, of concepts, could only take place in beautiful places in strict contact with nature. So uh, we thank uh, Kim Wilkie for sharing with us uh, his knowledge and his passion for what he does. Again, we thank him. I'd like to thank Bob Byrne, Executive Vice President of NYU, who has followed uh, the rebirth of La Pietra in every aspect from the very beginning, and still does. <laughs> and thank you, Bob, for being here with us tonight. And I think the best would be to uh, wish all of you what uh, Voltaire says at the end of Candide, il faut cultiver son jardin. One has to cultivate his or her own garden. <laughs> <laughs>